Lunch? Good, good. Hopefully uh, we're not all too carb loaded and you know if I was teaching this room would all be asleep so fortunately we won't have that problem. Um, we're going to have uh, Brad come back up and share with us again so the schedule sort of for this afternoon so you know what, uh, what to expect. Um, he's going to do his first session here um, about three o'clock ish we're going to have about a half hour break and we have we'll have uh, fruits and cheeses and uh, cookies and um, uppers and downers <laughs> you know <laughs> coffee all of that so um, you guys can enjoy the refreshments in the cafe uh, then we'll come back in he'll do a second session and then after that we're gonna have a time of Q&A and uh, we thought you know since this is a conference about the dangers of technology the best way to curate that was to use technology so um, what we'd like to provide uh, on our church app, um, you just go to, uh, to signups and you'll see our conference and click on it and it, it says submit a question, click here. And so you click the link and that will be an easy way for you to submit your question to us and we'll get them and then we'll uh, discuss them at the end. If, if you're not, if, if maybe the Lord just convicted you today and you said I'm not allowed to touch any technology right now, um, good old fashioned paper works as well. Uh, we have the notepads over by the offering box where Will is displaying them very graciously to us. There you go. So great for you to take notes. And if you have a question, um, you can just write it down on that and you can hand it to me some point today um, and, and we'll be happy to, to go through them. So let me just say, you guys are here today. That's awesome. Um, Brad didn't chase you away and if you're here that indicates to me the Holy Spirit's working in your life so I'm mean, very encouraged by that I'm um, blessed you guys if, if, you're, if you're, for those who are not here I'm not saying the Holy Spirit's not working in their lives oh, he is, he is. Um, but very encouraged that you guys are, are here um, I know um, I just yeah I know personally God's using this already and it's going to be a catalyst for you, for me, for our fellowship, for maybe this community, Lord willing, uh, in the days ahead. So thank you for coming. Um, I'm blessed for that, and I know we're blessed to have Brad. So again, welcome home, and we'll, we'll get into it. Thank you, friend. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm so short, my feet showed up on my passport photo. <laughs> Was there anyone not here during the first service? If you raise your hand, let's welcome them first of all. Thank you. Did somebody promise you coffee and then bring you here? Because <laughs> that was what I told them to do. Uh, now that will tell me how much to repeat, so I, I will be very brief about that. For those of you whom I did not have the privilege of, of meeting, uh, I'm an author. Uh, I'm a minister. I'm credentialed in ministry, but I write books and academic papers and things like that. Uh, Beth and I come from the state of Virginia, and you might hear a little bit of an accent because we're hillbillies. Uh, we come from the Appalachian Blue Ridge Mountains up there, and uh, we live down in the Shenandoah Valley. I, was, uh, I got a call from uh, this bush church way out in the outback of Australia, and they said, well, how many people do you require? I said, well, how big's your town? And uh, she said, oh, about 6,000. I said, well, mine has 250. I'll come. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me to the big city. So we don't come from a very big place. And you may have seen Beth out at the uh, table. Obviously, I married up. So um, Beth is the love of my life, and she makes all this stuff work. Some of the places where I'm fortunate enough to do research, a lot of places, but one of them is the University of South Africa. I'm part of their Bureau of Market Research in the Consumer Neuroscience Laboratory. During COVID, um, and these are some of the folks that I do research with, um, they all of the equipment and things that we used uh, use went out because you have to license all this gear and all this these things so uh, I was just there in Africa twice over uh, between October and November for about six weeks and uh, they told me that the um, licenses have all been renewed now since COVID is sort of I mean it's still there but nobody's uptight about it much so that's what I do uh, travel there and then I preach at different places around the world a lot um, in Australia as well so I'm getting ready to head there uh, next week we go to Honolulu I'll be at Calvary Chapel Honolulu for about four days ministering and then off to uh, Thailand for three weeks and then on to Australia 
back to Oregon. There's about 10 Calvary chapels coming together for a men's conference, then I think down to L.A., and then finally mid-May we'll be back home. So we travel a lot. We're missionaries to this generation. So I work with law enforcement. So this is my colleague, Sergeant Nigel Dalton. He's in charge of the crime prevention unit, and cyber issues fall under him. And so we're in the police car for about three weeks uh, in May, uh, running around to a lot of schools, and I get to do research there. So that's, in a nutshell, what I do, and I write these books and spend a lot of time in the, in the news about this. What I want to do is continue on exposing some of the problem, problems with this, but I want to start to be top-heavy on solutions. So as I said this morning, I showed you those brain animations on addiction. You remember the wall? And that's the wall. It's a dopaminergic barrier that forms. It's actually a chemical reaction trying to push out too much dopamine. How to get that wall down and how to get... Um, the color back in the brain, and I'll explain that through MRIs. But I want to test the audio because we have not tested the audio yet. So what I'm going to do is, I told you I'm from Hillbilly Country. I want to play for you an emergency call that came in in Hillbilly Country. This is how we react when they come in. 911, what's your emergency? Yeah, um, my wife got attacked by a warthog real bad, and I need someone to come up with an ambulance and pick her up. Okay, sir, uh, can you give me your address? Uh, yeah, we're at 1825 Eucalyptus Drive. Okay, could you spell that for me, sir? Uh, I, I'm going to drag her on over to Oak Street, and you can pick her up there. <laughs> Redneck. Um... <laughs> You'll be all right in about all four minutes. Um, <laughs> dopamine. So I used your temporal lobes, which the part of your brain right by your ear, uh, ears, if you have two of them. And, and where I'm from, they don't always have everything. But uh, <laughs> Or they have too many. Six toes on, anyway. And I also used uh, other parts of your brain, visual part, that back here where your visual happens and all this. Don't want to get too technical. but um, and, and there's about four places in the brain that releases this dopamine for various functions of the brain. But the one that we're talking about today is the nucleus accumbens or the pleasure center of the brain. So when you look at Netflix and you're looking at YouTube videos and all this funny stuff like I just showed you, that's what you're doing. You're, you're inducing pleasure in the nucleus accumbens of the brain. And the Bible says laughter is like a medicine until you overdose on the medicine. And when you overdose on the medicine, the dopamine levels get too high, then cognition shuts down. So what I thought I would do is I would start off um, by just telling you a few practical things of, from neuroscience about cognition, spirituality, and how these, things, how these things work. Have you ever been sitting at a table with somebody and you're getting ready, you're having a conversation, a deep conversation, and you know, it's good to talk to people face to face because endorphins get released, God gets involved when two or three are gathered in his name. And all of a sudden, now I know you've never done this, but their phone goes off. It beeps, notification goes off. And they're they're looking down, and then they're looking at you and they're going, uh-huh, uh-huh, I'm listening. I'm uh-huh, uh-huh. And it's annoying because, well, it's a, it's rude. Now, what we know from that is a lot of things. First of all, there's not a human being on earth that can multitask. So they're not listening to you. They can't. And so next time that happens, I encourage you to try something. Next time they're looking down, going, uh huh, just can't, because the polite thing to do is to keep talking, even though they're not listening to you. But in order to not be rude, you just keep talking. And they keep going, uh-huh, but they're not listening. Say, try this. Say something like this. This is of sort of redneck, something I would do. You pick your own. But I would just say, oh, you know, the other day my leg fell off. <laughs> Duct tape is a wonderful thing. And they'll go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> try it. All right, so what I want to do is I want to give you a poetry test. So, so who, ladies, can you multitask better than men? Raise your hand if you can. Of course you can. It's not a trick question. So you got three kids, like Pastor does. I mean, a live wire, pal. You got to be on top of this, right? So while these children 
are roaming around the house, rummaging, pillaging, burning everything in sight and doing all this. Mom can juggle this, right? And, and she can do the appointments of the dentist and she can manage all this sort of stuff. Where's dad during all this chaos? He's on the couch. Because if dad had to manage all of that stuff, the children would, would die, right? <laughs> but we're not talking about that kind of multitasking. We're talking about when you have your phone on and it's sending you notifications. You got multiple tabs open. You got the report for the boss you're supposed to be working and you're juggling all these things, jumping back and forth. It's called toggling in neuroscience circles. People used to having job descriptions, in order for you to do this job proficiently, you have to be a good multitasker. Well, the corporate world caught on that the productivity went down 40%, and when the productivity goes down 40%, the money goes down. So the corporate world has fixed that, but the academic world has not received that memo. So they still, not all, but many are still peddling this idea that you've got to get technology into the hands of the kids the earliest age possible, teach them how to be good multitaskers if they're going to fill the jobs that are coming. Neuroscience is proven. Now, in science, you're not supposed to say proven, but convinced us quite convincingly. You're not supposed to use the same word anyway. Uh, that nobody can do it, and they can't. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to multitask. Not the five or six things that you normally juggle at the same time, just two, two things at the same time. So by definition, multitasking means it's the belief, it's the false notion, the false belief that the brain can receive two or more streams of data simultaneously, retain that information, and use it. Well, the brain is a sequential processor, as it turns out. So for those of you who are nerdy, uh, you know if you have a multi-core processor, you can take one large task and you can give it to the computer. It will break it up into subtasks, process it at the same time, thus rendering out your final output very rapidly. And it used to be believed that the brain could do that, but it can't. The brain has one core, one processor, and it can only do one thing at a time. I'm going to ask you to do two. I'm going to put a written poem on the screen, and I simply want you to read it. At the same time, I am going to play a second and different poem being read audibly, and I want you to pay attention to that. And at the conclusion of both of these very brief poems, I'm going to give you a cognitive test to see how well your brain receives two or more streams of data simultaneously. You ready? Don't look at me, look at the screens. Okay, here we go. The moon seems very lovely each night it passes by, so beautiful and shiny upon the velvet sky. And yet the moon is really dead, its light is not its own. Though shiny it may seem, it's really just a stone. Okay, how many of you participated? You tried, raise your hand. How many of you got two seconds into it and said, nope, this ain't gonna happen? How many of you, after about three seconds max, you said, oh, forget it. I'm just going to pay attention to one and do the best I can on this stupid thing. How many of you did that? You just picked one. How many of you picked the written one? It's because you're lazy. Now, <laughs> we all are. Here's the test. I don't want you to quote both poems in their entirety. I want to know who can word for word quote just the first line of each poem. Now, I have given this test to literally hundreds of thousands of people and no one has ever passed it. You know why? When you're reading, you hear mumble. Then you switch rapidly, and the younger you are, the more quickly you can do it. Now you're listening, but you can't read. So data is missing. Nobody can do it. So the grades, when you put a, in schools, you put a tablet in front of children with unfettered access, or a teacher with 30 students, she can't keep an eye on all of them, they're doing a lot on that tablet except what they're supposed to be doing, but they're also jumping. Universities are famous for this, more so than high school, middle school, and elementary schools, because they have allowed the students to have tablets and laptops in there, and so they've got multiple tabs open, to, one to take notes, but they're also on social media looking at porn, playing video games, et cetera, et cetera. Am I making sense? And they cannot multitask, but they will tell you that they can. So a typical session, a study session, and this is also germane to those of you who work in the office. So let's just say it's a student, math, history, and English. If it's the office, it would be the Excel spreadsheet, it would be the report for the boss, and so on. So it applies to both, all right? So a study was done, and let me ask you this question. How many of you, uh, would, how many of you would think that, that math, or how long do you think? Let me, let me just ask it this way. How many um, minutes do you think somebody studies math 
or does a report for the boss, something legitimate, before they grab their phone to check social media or something? How, how long do you say they would study before they leave? Six minutes? Ten minutes? It's two minutes. There were cameras on a large study group. Now, when you ask them, and I've done this ad nauseum, the students will sincerely tell you, because when you're on, when you're having dopamine rushes, perception of time goes away. So you estimate, and it's always wrong, most often. They'll tell you, I study about 20 minutes, and then I check something for about two or three minutes, and, then, and they do that. The reality is they're doing something legitimate for two minutes, and they get bored, and then they jump. Now, this, is, this jumping is called toggling. And they're gone anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour. And then they come back. Now, there's a multi-pronged problem with studying in this way. In the hippocampus in the brain is the short-term memory that we retain information during the day when we're studying, doing office work. Then at night, when we sleep, that's when that information gets transferred into long-term memory. The brain wants us to have total silence with no music, not even classical. There have been thousands of studies that if you listen to even classical music when you're working or studying, this information is getting jumbled. But every kid I know wears earbuds when they're studying. So. And, and they'll say, I'm the exception. I can do it. And they can't. Nobody can. So what ends up happening, the information in this little place in the brain, you, uh, you, you can think of it as a little thimble. Remember the thimbles that you put on your finger? I never sewed, but I saw my grandmother do it. So that when the needle hits it, you don't say Christian swear words. <laughs> I'm like, dang it. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. <laughs> That's acceptable where I'm from. The other one is not. Somebody will hit you. But anyway, so this thimble is really small, and the information goes in that little thimble, then at night it sort of gets poured out. Well, if you study in a continuous manner, 20 minutes to, to two hours with silence, that information goes in there, and, and you can think of it as a schema or a straight line. And at night, it gets transferred that way so that you can recall because everything's in one part of the brain. Nobody studies that way anymore, especially the kids. And so they're doing this number, right? So what ends up happening in that little thimble, the information gets put in in drips and drabs, and then when it gets transferred, it's scattered, leaving them with a scattered brain. So when I do teacher professional development at schools, I, the teachers love me because I go, you know, like Tuesday, you said we're going to cover, you know, right triangles on Thursday, and you give them the, the background for it, and then on Thursday, they swear you never told them. And it's because they can't draw an association because of the way that they're constantly jumping. They're not paying it. It's the poetry test. Am I making sense to you? Spiritually, people have brought this into their devotional lives as well. They've taken their phone and their tablet, and it has ended. So while you're sitting there with a Bible, that's the two-minute bit. So the biblical worldview rates have gone down to 4% in those categories, 7 and 10. The boomers, the Gen X, millennials, and Gen Z. Are you following me? And so people go, what am I supposed to do? Well, if you can think clearly, no more devices during devotion time and study time. But the school requires it. Well, if you really want to know the truth, a child, <clears throat> this little area behind your forehead is called the prefrontal cortex. That's where we have impulse control, the brakes. So the pleasure center that I showed you this morning, that little dot, that's the accelerator in the car. And dopamine is the fuel. So when a child is looking at YouTube videos and looking at porn and doing social media and chatting and all this sort of stuff, the gas pedal is mashed and the gasoline is flowing into that engine like crazy. The dopamine is just flooding, right? Problem is they don't have brakes because that's the last part of the brain to develop doesn't develop fully until you're at least 25 years of age. And if you're, no matter what age, if you're addicted, the brakes are already failed too. But they have no, so what's happened is we've given unfettered use of these devices to children and they have no brakes. So addictions have just globally, I mean, people go, why do you go to Africa? Why are you in Namibia? Well, I, you can go to these townships where they have mud floors, no food hardly, no clothes hardly, but everybody's got a nice phone. 
the world in the last eight years has radically been changed. So that uh, has, my mission field has expanded to the township people. <laughs> Am I making sense? So this is really the culprit, I think, as to where a lot of this sort of thing starts. And it, we, we've taken a real hit academically. But, but to me, I'm a minister, so spiritually we've taken a hit because we don't have a, an attention span long enough to focus on God, which scientifically we know that doing this gives you ADHD. And if you are bo I, there's, there's debate as to whether or not people are actually born with it. Let's just, for the sake of argument, use a 2% figure of kids that are born with it. I question that, but let's just pretend. It exacerbates those that are born with it, and it creates it in others, and they dole out medicine like crazy for ADD and ADHD when that's the culprit, but it never dawns on people to stop that, to take this completely away, because that's what you have to do. It's quiet. I'm just telling you the truth, though. There is an advantage to the truth. It frees you. I mean, so I could, like, lie to you. There, if you, Pastor, I know plenty of people who speak, not at this level, but, but that will come in and lie. And y'all, they all feel really good about your balance and limit and neutral and all that sort of stuff. But, all right, am I making sense to you so far? Is this helpful in any way? So, monotask. Everybody say monotask. Do one thing at a time in total silence. I was asked, the question was asked of me. Where's my brother that was asking me about what does it look like for me? Thank you. What is your name? Levi. Levi. Oh, wow, you're keeper of the law. That's great. All right. <laughs> so now you're going to hold me accountable, aren't you? All right. So I'll just give you like. The two I've written a whole chapter on what it looks like for Beth and me after I've aggregated all I've been talking about all this science all these years and doing this work what does it look like for me it's not perfect okay but it's close basically the first thing I did and I'll talk to you about this at length I started sleeping that sounds weird but I wasn't for years four hours a night maybe because I was busy. You, so, so when I got honest and the truth, when I let the truth, when I just started doing the truth thing, I got freed. The truth is, I was watching television, Netflix, doing all that stuff, and saying I was busy. So I do watch some television, and now I'm careful. So I record stuff, like um, Treasure of Oak Island or whatever that's called. And for seven years, they have gotten me. They make me think they go find something. And it, you may as well be looking for Yeti because they've never found anything. And I buy it every week. But there's no F-bombs. You hear what I'm saying? And you can fast forward through the commercials. They ought to get an amen from somebody. So we do watch that. And I'll, I'll admit, my YouTube watching, I'll cover this with you in a little bit. Exercise has got to become part of your life for brain health and spiritual health. I started, I took gymnastics in college. I didn't, wasn't on the team, I took the class. So um, I do gymnastics now, and uh, rings and calisthenic sports and all that. And um, I went back to that. So I watch three things that I like. I watch on YouTube um, new gymnastics and calisthenics things that I wanna do, muscle ups and planches and all that. And I like UFC, I know it's probably a sin, but I, if two people want to beat the living daylights out of each other, I will watch, okay? <laughs> I won't do it, but I will gladly watch them do it because it's, yes. And then um, basically things, all things nerd. So right now, uh, something related to this. AI is the big thing. I've written academically about AI, so I will usually watch something about AI. And then at 7.30, I'm in bed. I was in bed at 8 o'clock last night. And I'll tell you why. I owe it to this pastor who went to the, in this church who went to the expense to bring us in. I owe it to you to have gotten up this morning and had devotions, not because I'm a saint, but precisely because I'm a redneck. I need, to, I need Jesus, okay? But I, I owe it to have had a full night's sleep and come in here having had devotions and I've gone to the gym and be topped up with no screen time going through my head with too much dopamine 
I owe that to God first and I owe that to you. Now that's, a, that's an ethical thing that I feel like God has given me. So screens cannot play a part of that. Now, did I have screen time this morning? After all that, I turned it on. After the important stuff, but not until then. So, typical day is the phones go off at 4 o'clock. And, and, and for neurological reasons, never have notifications on my phone. Ever. They're never on. So it never beeps, it never dings, it never nothing. Because what happens is, the, the last research project that I organized in the lab was I saw a project, a, a research study, where they had Anderson Cooper. It's on CNN. It's got to be right. Now, they had Anderson Cooper's brain wired, and they were sending notifications to his phone, unbeknownst to him that they were doing it on purpose, and his brain was spiking, which indicate the waves were showing their spike, which indicates he had cortisol. You know what cortisol is? It's a stress hormone. He was surging through his body because he couldn't answer the phone while he was doing this. So I took it to the department head and said, this looks like torturing people would be fun. Let's do this. But I want to measure the cortisol. I want to see how much cortisol that is spiking. So we, we got an experimental group, and it's complicated, but we did all the right stuff. And unfortunately, what ended up happening was about halfway through the study, one of the researchers came to me and said, it's not going to work. And I went, why? And he goes, 50% so far, at least, of these people are on antidepressants. And it's going to skew the chemistry. Because we had, you know, we had to send all this off to pathology. So what we basically did is we collected bodily fluids at the beginning and at the end. So you torture them in the middle. <laughs> Actually, what we had them do, we had them hooked up to a bunch of stuff monitoring the brain. And then we had them looking at a screen counting sheep. And you had to count the sheep jumping over this log. Wasn't anything. But unbeknownst to them, I said, look, uh, g give me your phone. We're just going to sit all your phones over here because it's not part of the project. And just count these sheep. And then we were ringing their phone. And they couldn't get it. And they were getting stressed, which I loved. But so, so they were... But the problem is, but what I can tell you is, what I can tell you is, uh, we couldn't give definitive results of that. Your cortisol levels are spiking. And if you will turn them off permanently forever, you will live and only have little spikes. Instead of staying up here, you will live here and I know because you, you live life, you're going to have some spikes. Am I making sense to you? So those are some of the practical things that I wanted to help you with because of us having too much cortisol by the end of the day we're feral you know what that term feral means <laughs> like an old feral cat that should be shot okay that's, that's redneck probably shouldn't say that <laughs> in the cities I don't say that all right so so monotask and not have notifications on so what do you do about the the notifications all right I use what's called the favorites you know what the favorites is on your phone? So no notifications. And there are two people on my favorites list. My mother, who has congestive heart failure, and my wife. Fair enough. That's it. The last time I added someone, my stepfather was, on, was in hospice. And I knew that, because at that time, don't you dare tell her I said this. I wouldn't even put my mother on it. <laughs> I would call her. But, but I let my mother in, of course, because it's my mother. And so then, and then I had a doctor's report, uh, some lab results coming back to me. And so I added the doctor's number so it would ring. And as soon as they called, I took it out. But, and you don't see my phone at all today. Because I'm with you, not with a gazillion other people trying to get in touch with me today. And I'm not even mindful of them because I detoxed. And it's a wonderful thing to have that level of peace. But I return every call. And I have blocks of time that I do that. And by working sequentially and putting all the emails in one contiguous place, text messages, I get it done 40% quicker. And because I'm working linearly, my brain stress is still not perfect, but it's lower. Does that help? So I return all my calls. I'm not rude, but I have set times for that. So I'm monotasking. And I never, ha never have constant interruptions. So basically... When you're in the office or when you are with your kids and you, you, you're going to have to structure their time, you can't just show them this and then ask them to do this. 
they they don't have the ability to do that to be made to do it. You're not their friend, you're their parent. And there's been a real shift in the way people parent. But you're gonna have to go back to like being the parent. So you have to set the atmosphere in the office as well as the study time and at the school in the academic. Total silence. No, none of this talking all the time and music playing and letting them sort of do what they want and all this. You have to teach children from a very young age that, that during this time, church, and when we pay attention, we're quiet. We don't have the phones on. We don't do any of this sort of stuff. And no music, even classical. No music. And then no phone because that's what they're that's where they're acquiring the music from okay and had their earbuds and then during COVID I had to add entertainment tabs because what was happening was 50% uh, of the kids in Boston never even logged in and I think it was 60% in Philadelphia never even logged in but they were online they just weren't in their academic stuff but the ones who did log in they had multiple tabs open, so they had the Zoom or the Google Classroom or whatever it was they were platform they were using for the academics, but they were using the other tabs, which was TikTok, porn, social media, and video games. So I had to add no tabs. So when you sit down to do your office report or math, that's it. You're monotasking. And when you're in the devotional closet and it's time for Bible reading, Total silent, except for the slurping of coffee. That's another addiction uh, that I have. So, and then English, and then I'm being very sincere. If I were you, I would never allow those. I would ban them and never any more video games ever again. None. And even though I say that, people still ask me, so what's the acceptable amount of time? There is no acceptable, well, how much cocaine are you willing to give your kids? The addiction's the same. The brain scans are clear. The addiction is identical. I showed you that this morning, and to heroin in some cases. Lock size to the and you'll still be wrong. And, and I, <laughs> and, and kids will go, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And the problem for them, I do know what I'm talking about. And I'm not being arrogant. I'm just telling you the truth. And they're not the exception, and neither are you. And your anger doesn't intimidate me. I, I, don't, I don't see anybody here angry. <laughs> but I'll tell them that. I'm not bothered by your anger. You don't intimidate me like you do your mother. You're just a little punk to me when you act like that, in need of Jesus. I, I fire back. I don't put up with it. And I don't, if some kid came at me, I would not take one for the team. Because <laughs> I come from the old school. Anybody with me on that one? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Twice I thought, oh Lord, here we go. But fortunately, both of them settled down. Because I probably would have, this kid, I gave the poetry test at this school. And he failed it. And he kept saying, give it again. I'm like, Dude, I gotta move on. It's okay. Nobody passed. I can get it this time. Give it. I'm like, no. And he started. I'm like, oh god. And fortunately, he finally settled down. Then this one other kid, I was talking about video games, and he he started to get like that too. And I'm like, oh Lord, Jesus help me, because <laughs> I will anyway. So research shows that you learn more when you read from paper instead of a screen. And there's study after study after study after study after study after study. So you can try to find the loopholes, but you'll still be wrong. Um, you can say things like, I disagree, and you'll still be wrong. You're going to, if we put you in a lab and we have you read the exact same material, whether it be fiction or nonfiction, from screen to paper, then you're going to see that your cognition was much lower on the screen. So if you want to maximize your Bible reading, read the paper version. In your study, keep your phone completely out of there. It's shocking, isn't it? So the question always is, what about the Kindle? What about iBooks? Well, the convenience is undeniable. So let me tell you what I do. My, I, I bought into all that, and then I quit. 
So what I do now, all my long form reading, like I just read a whole bunch of books. I had to deal with this woke thing. So from a theological point of view, a political point of view, and all this sort of stuff, I started reading books about BLM, the Marxist stuff, and all the woke and the social justice. So these are these are pretty academic things, and I wanted to maximize my time and my cognition, so I read them on paper. But because I will reference them and stick them up on PowerPoint, I bought the digital version. But my long-form study was all done on paper, and then just to quickly copy and paste, that's not going to hurt me because you can search it quickly. Does that make sense? So I'm not anti. It's how it's used to my advantage instead of it hurting me. So I'm not anti on anything. So I have both iBooks and Kindle, and uh, I use them, but not for long-form study. There, there's, there was an, uh, an exception one time. I was asked by a friend in the UK to review his book. And any of us who write books, you know the manuscripts are always digital first before they get printed. And so he wanted a review. And he sent it to me, and I read it for him off of a PDF. And I probably should reread it off of the paper version so that I learn more. Research also shows that you learn more when you take notes on paper instead of typing them. Would you like to hear about one of the many studies they did to show why this is the case, or they found out why this is the case? They took a, a, a large auditorium, put a podium similar to this, and they told this side of the room, I'm going to give a lecture. We want you to take notes on paper however you want to. Pen, paper, pencil, paper, doesn't matter, just paper. This side, use any device you want, your tablet, your laptop, your phone, whatever. Just, just take notes. Enjoy the lecture. So they gave a lecture. Then they tested both sides to see who learned more. The people who took notes on paper crushed the group that took notes on a device. And here's, then they went to find out why. Here was basically some of the reasons. The group who took notes on paper tended to do bullet points instead of, like this group, they typed word for word, which showed they were actually engaged with the presenter and only writing keywords to trigger the brain to, for the test. This group was typing, for whatever reason, word for word. The problem is they could not type as fast as the presenter could speak, nor could they multitask because no one can. And so the presenter's down on point number two and three. They're still finishing up point number one, but they're missing two and three because they can't pay attention to more than one thing at a time. Am I making sense? So this group beat this group. Now, parenting advice from Silicon Valley. This is the New York Times, so it has to be right. Now, actually, um, the, one, the one thing about, I've been asked, are any tech companies after you? No, they actually, no, not at all. They agree with me. And the New York Times, the only thing I agree with the New York Times, they write brutally honest about technology and brain science. They're, they, they, when it's political, they're out to lunch, in my opinion. But when it comes to this, just straight down the line, and I suspect it's because they have children that they care about. Suddenly they're conservative when it's their kids. You understand what I'm saying? But anyway... I wondered, this was many years ago, how do these guys in Silicon Valley who invent all this stuff, how do they manage it in their home? How are they? I, my assumption was they would have next year's technology in their home because they have access to it. And here's what I found. The chief technology officer of eBay sends his children to a nine-classroom school here. So do employees of Silicon Valley giants like Google, Apple, Yahoo, and Hewlett Packard. But the school's chief teaching tools are anything but high-tech. Pins and paper, knitting needles, and occasionally mud. Not a computer to be found, no screens at all. They're not allowed in the classroom, and the school even frowns on their use at home. These tech executives love their children deeply. Not yours, theirs. These are Waldorf Steiner schools. I don't recommend Steiner. They're a bit new agey, but I've spoken at one. They treated me well, but it was like a bunch of hippies running a school. But their brain science and cognition, their kids are smart because they have taken all that stuff out of the equation. They asked the parents not to use it at home, and this is where the tech people are sending their kids. And the dirty little secret is many of those children raised that way are the ones that end up going back into Silicon Valley and running everything because their brains are intact. They were allowed to pass through those critical stages without any damage. Steve Jobs, New York Times, was a low-tech parent. So your kids must love the iPad, asked Mr. Jobs, trying to change the subject. 
They haven't used it. And unlike most parents who say they limit technology, Jobs actually meant it. So what did he do? Well, every evening, Steve made a point of having dinner at the big long table in their kitchen discussing books and history and a variety of things. He said no one ever pulled out an iPad or a computer. They weren't addicted at all. He loved his children. So he raised them properly. He doesn't love your children. He's dead now, but you get the point? And yet we've bought into their, their marketing that we got to give it to them. But they wouldn't love to use it. This is a group of fourth graders, and I had just asked them this question. How many of you, your parents, allow you to have Internet-connected devices in your bedroom overnight? Well, that's how many hands went up. It got, all over the world, that's how many hands goes up. I'm in schools all the time, thousands of kids, except in America. I'm in the Christian schools, the public schools. They Google me, find out I'm a preacher. They don't let me in anymore. But this, this was, a, I think, a public school in, in another country. So I'd ask him, how many of you, fourth graders, your parents allow you to have Internet-connected devices in your bedroom overnight? Where, duh. What do you have? When we poll them, well, duh. Phones, Xbox, Wii, tablets, the usual, TVs. So this particular night, as every time I do this, about 500 of their parents showed up that night at the parent meeting. And at some point in the presentation, I said, okay, how many of you parents allow your children to have internet-connected devices in their bedroom overnight? Seven hands went up out of 500, seven. So I said, okay, <clears throat> that's funny because let's look at how your kids answered that very question this morning. And this nervous laughter went through the auditorium and I said, let's try this again without lying this time. Because all of you lying. You are. You're just lying. So sheepishly, all the hands go up. Now that's the difference between truth and freedom, and you can do something about it, because those parents believe their children are the exception to everything that I'm saying. And they're not. That's why the numbers are wretchedly miserable. When I wrote this last book, Digital Rehab, I kept telling Beth, this is the last tour I'll ever do. Nobody's going to ever have me back. And I'm good with that. This may be the last time you see me. We're, we're in trouble. And you know it. We've lost this generation, two of them. Their parents and them, they're gone. Ken, ask Ken Ham, he'll tell you. They've been gone. The research they did years ago. And the only thing I'm really doing is affirming what they've already discovered just by being on the ground with them. And so I'm going for it. I'm, I'm, I want revival so badly. I don't care if I never get to go, do another global tour again, ever. Now, don't get me wrong, I want to. This is what I do. But if I don't, I'm, I'm going to sound the alarm, and then I'm done. I don't know that that'll happen. I'll be in Africa and the Philippines and places where God's moving, and, and, and in Calvary Chapel, apparently. No, really, because I can still do that in America, but it, it's just it's narrowing where I can go because I talk like this. I haven't told you one untrue thing, and I do love you dearly. I'm one of you. I struggle with sin. Can you tell? I'm, I'm, I get over the top sometimes. I have bad attitudes sometimes. I don't always say things to my wife properly. I'm just like everybody else. But at least I'll tell you I've got problems. <laughs> and that's how I, that's how, why God will fix me and let me keep going. Because I'll just like, all right, uh, you're right. Well, as if I need You ever told God dumb stuff like that? Like, I know. <laughs> all right, so <clears throat> am I helping you, though? In a weird way. I was at a school down here in Florida. It was at Vero Beach. No, Palm Beach. Last year. And it's rare that it's a big school. And um, I was allowed to do research, which is unusual in this country. Not in other countries, but they gave me access. So I sent some surveys ahead of me and had them collect some data for me before I got down there. 
And this was just the sixth grade, a big school. So I only could only do the spiritual emphasis just for the sixth grade this time. I've been there two, three other times. But um, I just asked him, you know, what, what apps are you using? Sixth grade. So the top two that you'll see there, TikTok and Roblox, both of which I highly recommend you ban. Never let them use it ever again. Of course, you should never let them use Instagram or Snapchat either. But that's what they're doing. I mean, this is the Christian school, which is not a reflection of the school. It's a reflection of their parents. So other questions that I ask, have you ever chatted with someone online that you don't know? Well, duh. So they're on video games. There's, you know, And we've asked them in other countries, and I'm sure it would be the same here, do you ever hear swearing? Do they talk about sex? Any older people try to talk to you about? You see the problem? And then have you ever been bullied? Well, you might think that's low, and it relatively is, except people who've been bullied, their brain scans show that they have post-traumatic stress disorder just like a soldier. And it's cumulative. Are you aware of age restrictions? Now, the reason why I put that in there is 60% knew that they were lying when they answered yes. That's a moral dilemma. Lying is, is a sin. I mean, so we just aggregated some of their favorite Netflix series, and some of this stuff is foul. Shouldn't be in a Christian home. And these are their social, favorite social media influencers, some of their favorite YouTube channels, and some of their favorite video games. But I want to show you where this, how this manifests itself. I want to show you a video clip from California, from Calvary Chapel Rialto Schools. Great school, great church that has me speak out there. And um, the principal recorded this. So what I was doing was I was going over those exact stats to the students. So when I was talking about the Lord... No pulse. Eee. The minute I started putting these things up there, I want to show you the reaction. How about the social media? <laughs> <laughs> So what that is is a dopamine trigger. So I triggered them with dopamine. Do you see where their affections are? Do you see where their intimacies are? Do you see where their hearts are? And that's at a Calvary Chapel school. The school itself is good. That's not a reflection of Calvary Chapel. That's a reflection of parenting. Are you with me? They brought that into school, and then the school brings me in to play the social worker when they're supposed to be teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic and Bible, but now they're having to bring me in to deal with this stuff because the parenting has failed at all. Now, I, I don't want to be harsh to you, brothers and sisters. I want you to hear my heart. That bothers me because I, I'm an evangelist. I'm a missionary, and I want the whole world going to heaven with me. And I'm afraid that when they're more excited and their intimacies and their hearts have been given to the culture instead of Jesus, I'm feeling God's heart. He's not mad. He's, he's, he's longing to have us back. He wants this generation to love him with all of their mind, soul, and strength. All of them. He wants all of their heart and not any given over to the devil. None. Or the spirit of the age, as the Apostle Paul called it in Ephesians. So it's in that heart that I talk to you this way, not to call you a bad parent. Well, the whole world has fallen under this. God has just brought me here to say, look, let's just all get together as a family and do something about it and solve it with his help. Because I fell into it too. And we can solve it. I've already given you a bunch of solutions. So let me show you some brain scans and give you one more solution and we'll take a break. But let me take your pulse. Do you still love me? I love you too. I do. 
I really do. Okay, so the brain scans. I'm going to show you two more sets, maybe three if we have time. This thing is over 300 slides long, two books worth of stuff, so I can't cover everything that I would like to, but I'm giving you the most of it. This scanning technology, somebody once said, oh, you're just doing this Christian thing, amen. No, that's his name. It's Daniel Amen. He's a neuroscientist. <laughs> I'm not trying to trick you. People. Anyway, <laughs> that is a baseline of a normal, what is known to be a normal brain. So this scanning technology is called single photon emission computed tomography. So it's, think of a to topographical map. What you're looking for is the valleys and the hills. That's a relatively smooth one. The homeostasis, neurons are firing and all that. So then you compare what you think is a damaged brain next to it. You measure the deviation. So the first one I'll show you is somebody who smokes marijuana. And it's legal. It's the dumbest thing. And they go, doesn't bother me, man. Like, that's why you talk like this, man. It's your brain looks like that, man. So there's the cocaine brain, and video gamers' brains look like that in many cases. That's why we call the second book Digital Cocaine, is because that's what the gamers end up looking like. And then there's, of course, the meth. And let's go back to the baseline. That drug went in through a needle. That's the heroin brain. See how it responded? Brain is shutting down. Neurons not firing. Personalities change. They'll steal from their family, whatever they got to do to get the drug. The coke went up the nose, and here's the porn brain. And that drug went in through the eyes from a phone. Went right into the nucleus accumbens, and the brain responded. And you and I are not the exceptions. I don't do it that much. That's enough. It's toxic. That's why a lot of heroin addicts prefer heroin over orgasms. And I'm not being crude. They would rather do heroin than they would have sex. They'll tell you that. The high is much higher. And God did not make us that way. But there's hope. So in the second part of this, we're about to take a break. Dr. Daniel Amen provides treatment. And as you can see from the before and after, the holes are starting to fill in. Brothers and sisters, the good news is if you accidentally cut yourself, you clean the wound and pretty much leave it alone in about three weeks, you'll never even know you cut yourself. The brain will repair too. It's called neuroplasticity. It's a wonderful thing. God built that in and that's what he wants. So I want to show you, I'll go ahead and show you the MRIs now and uh, elaborate on it maybe a little bit later. Because I want to leave you on a very positive note. I want you to come back. Because I want to show you why I came. From, just from the human perspective. To show you what God wants. It's a neuroscience study on video gaming. I believe it was Minecraft. That, that was one of them I think the kids were playing. But anyway. That's Dr. David Rosenberg. And he's being interviewed on 2020s quite some time back. And they picked several children to participate in this video gaming study they were doing. All their brains were trash, but they wondered if they could recover. So in the one I'm going to show you, they picked triplets. Their brains were similar. And uh, one of them played video games excessively, and, and he had terrible problems. And so as you can imagine, when his mother was trying to get the game away from him to put him in the study, he was having a freak out, right? Turn it off now. Stop, Mom. You're still playing. You know, I said I'm going to watch. It said I'm going to go play outside with Josh. Now, how many of you, if you're my age, I'm 72. Am I looking all right? I'm 58. <laughs> some of you, some of y'all fell for that. Like, dang, he looks good. Um, thank you. <laughs> now I don't look so good because I told you. But anyway, so how many of you at my age or older, you would have never gotten that far before Kaboom. Let's just do it a southern way with the old English, the King James. That boy needs a beating. <laughs> yeah, it says that. If you beat your child, you won't hurt them. If you beat your child, you save their soul from hell. That's how the King James rendered the thing. Anyway, um, so here's the MRIs, fMRIs. They, they put them in the, the tube, and they put the helmet on them. And you can see the color. Color's good. Remember I told you the goal is to restore that lighting up, right? So when the brain is healthy, 
not always, like kids who have autism, uh, they're on the spectrum at some level, they're, they have too much color, they're like Christmas trees, but under a normal brain, the color there on the unaffected ones are good. But look at the one on the right, his brain is atrophied. Just like if you injure yourself and you sit in a wheelchair and your legs shrink. Video gamers in China, they did a big study, they, they realized one part of their brain shrunk from lack of use because they were only using the other side. That's what they did forever. They were video game drunkards. Same here. So the brain is shut down. He's become anhedonic and he's become angry. And it's left this child this way. So they, they took the game away from him, they put him in the study and they sent him off to summer camp with no technology or television for three weeks. And they did terrible things to this child. They only let him swim, hike, fish, canoe. It's terrible. But after three weeks of no technology, they brought him back in, they scanned his brain, and let me show you why. One of the main key reasons I came here, that's what happened to the child. Somebody might want to give Jesus a hand clap for that. This is, this is the ultimate message. It's the truth to get to the freedom part. Because once his mother realized he's trashing, she, he's trashing his brain, or she allowed it. Now you can do something. The truth can free you. Brothers and sisters, three weeks. This is God's heart, not to beat you up because you've given him games. He brought me here to tell you that's what he wants to do. He's not mad at you or me because you have failed. There is no such thing as a perfect parent. There is none. What matters is if you make course correction when he deals with you. That's, that's what matters. There's grace that covers over a multitude of sins when you just walk in his direction. Do we call that good news? That's what the cross was all about, was for redemption. That's rede but I have never met anyone in all these hundreds of thousands of people that I've spoken to ever take me up on it. Ever. Because they think their child is the exception. Or they don't have time. I've heard that. Oh, I don't have three weeks. I have never, ever. That's the only mother that I've ever met who's done that. But I'm not discouraged. I'm going to keep going. Do you see how, why this is scaring me? God's offering that. It's just like when we preach the gospel and we offer this good news to the masses, but only a handful of people take you up on it. I haven't had anybody take me up on this because it's technology. It's not that bad. It's all about balance. It's a tool. It's how you use it. It's a chainsaw. If you want to compare it to a tool, and it's ripping your brain apart. Unless you quit. It's called repent. And when you walk toward God, there's healing in his wings. But you can't keep saying it's about balance it's about limiting and it's about it's neutral and it's a tool that stuff doesn't work brothers and sisters stopping the drug and letting the brain have some time to heal is what works just like any other drug addiction Whew. but look I know people tell me all the time in different churches be positive you need to be positive you need I'm positive that that's a good thing I'm positive absolutely sure that's a good thing Amen? All right, let me pray, and let's go eat something. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Lord, thank you for the openness here today. I just appreciate it, God. And I do pray for this family, these families here, Lord. I pray that somebody will grab a hold of this and detox their child and watch this transformation happen, and others, and let it spread like wildfire. Sin revival, Lord. Help us with our idolatry. We're full of it. And help us to tear down our ash repulse and get them out of the house of God. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your name that we ask these things. And bless the food, Lord, in the hands that have prepared it. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. So, uh, uh, we're going to take about 25 minutes. Um, 3.30 is when we want to be back in and do our next